Our next guest is an award-winning author whose debut collection of stories Friday Black was a New York Times bestseller. His novel Chain Gang All-Stars was a National Book Award finalist and is available in paperback now. Please welcome back to the show our friend Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I had to defend my title as least famous person to ever appear. here, so. <laughs> But this is your second time here now. You're gonna have to be a little bit more famous having been here twice. Uh, I haven't got to the place where people send me free things, so I feel like it doesn't count. Does it count until you get free stuff? No, it does not. You were here in 2018 for your wonderful short story collection, Friday Black. And it should be noted, you were supposed to be here on May 2nd of last year, the day after the writer's strike started. So I'm very happy we got this back on the book for your paperback. Yep. But um, you were very calm in 2018 for someone who had not been on TV before, as you are now. <laughs> Do you feel like your life has changed much from the first time we saw you? It changed a ton. I'm glad I came off as calm. I was panicking the first time. Okay. Today I'm panicking a little bit less. Uh, but I will say that first time I was on the show, you actually gave me a great gift. I don't know if you know this. Um, during my first book tour, my father was really sick. He had cancer. Okay. And I'm a child of Ghanaian immigrants, so that means that, uh, you know, Ghanaians always use their kids like almost like Uno cards with each other. <laughs> and like for their achievements and the things they do in life, like my son is a doctor, my daughter's an engineer. And so he's like really sick. He's like towards the end of his life, last couple months, but he got to see this. And on his own, he got the YouTube URL. I didn't even know he knew how to do that. <laughs> And he dropped that video in that WhatsApp, like, Uno out, you know? <laughs> My son is on Late Night with Seth. <laughs> so thank you. It, was a, it meant a lot. I am very, very happy uh, that worked out that way. Um, you, uh, we talked about Friday Black last time you were here, which is a wonderful short story collection that I highly recommend. This novel actually started as a short story yeah. for that collection. When did you realize you had more here then would fill a short story. So I had a little idea at first about a woman in the eye of the arena, and uh, I soon realized that I was interested in the prison system, and I felt that there was a connection between my initial idea and the carceral state in prisons. And then once I started to do the research into the carceral state in prisons, I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> this might be a problem here, and ended up just blowing up like crazy. So this is a story about uh, prisoners who are forced to fight uh, for entertainment. It yeah. basically becomes a sport. This is not a real world. It's a world you created, but there are footnotes throughout the books to ground us in the idea that, look, what I'm saying about the carceral system is based in fact. Was that something that you found in the writing? Were you worried you were getting too far away from real life and, and didn't want to let people sort of forgive what was happening? Yeah, it's really easy for people to just be like, well, this is a book about a woman with a hammer killing people. I once met someone who watched the whole series Squid Game, and I was like, oh, you watched it? I Let's talk about how evil capitalism is. And um, he's like, why are you talking about capitalism? I was like, because Squid Game. And he was like, what does Squid Game have to do with capitalism? <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> and so I, I really didn't want that to happen. For, for, me, I, for me, I wanted always to be able to remind us that as sort of intense as the premise of gladiatorial games through the prison system is, we actually live right now uh, with a system that is just as violent. You have these two characters, Thur War and uh, Stax, excuse me. Did you always know uh, that these two women were gonna be the heart of the book? I didn't. I, from the beginning, I did, had, did have at least Thur War, and I wasn't sure that she would be the protagonist, but I had this image of this woman in the eye of the arena, this woman who's being treated poorly, but was also kind of a star. And when I started to do the research into the prison system, as well as thinking about entertainment at large, it felt like it had to be a black woman that could be both adored, but also with this like spiteful edge to it, that could be sort of lauded and applauded, but also kind of jeered, like almost in the same breath. The example I sometimes give is that both LeBron James and Serena Williams occupy a space that most of us don't really know, and most of us will never know. But I would say that Serena occupies a space that even LeBron doesn't know, which is to say that she can be completely dominant, maybe the greatest athlete of all time, but also be reduced to maybe her sexuality, maybe be reduced to 
things that are outside the sport and sort of disrespect in the same breath. So I feel like a woman was able to, a black woman in particular, was able to capture all that nuance. And then her partner needed to be someone who could understand that situation fully. And so that's how it came to be. This is a, in many ways, a brutal story and a violent story. And yet there's a real humanity in the love between these two characters. Yeah. Is that a balance you know you have to have when you're writing a book like this? Because you are gonna make people face things that they are potentially squeamish about, but you also wanna have this through line where they have to care deeply about these characters. Yeah, I'm squeamish about them too. Like, yeah. I've never watched like a Saw movie on purpose by myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that as a writer, a big part of my job is actually to remind us that we can always be a little bit more compassionate even for those who have done really the absolute worst things. And so remembering that each character is a person with desires, with fears, with loves, even if they've done really terrible things, uh, reminding myself and therefore the reader of that feels like a big part of my project in general. You also obviously want to write a book that is readable and a page turner and thrilling that people are invested and want to know the ending of. Um, are, can you tell when you're writing that you have sort of found your way onto that track and that it has this sort of downhill momentum? Yeah, the best way to do it is to kind of like sit the book down for a little bit and then just read it yourself. And when you get bored, be like, that's a problem. Yeah. You know, uh, boredom tells you something. And I try my best to make sure that I feel engaged all the way through and by paying really close attention to the not only paragraph, or a sentence, but really the syllable level, you keep yourself engaged all the way through and hopefully people feel connected to the end. You read sometimes and you're telling us you do get bored. Are there other times you're reading your own work and you're like, all right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all the time. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> all the time now. Yeah. But especially when it's done, like I was, I was listening to the audio book the other day to get, and get ideas about how I should read it myself. And it was a section I hadn't listened to in a long time and I was like, you're pretty good at this, bro. <laughs> <laughs> this book was very uh, well received, uh, both by critics and uh, by readers. But there are some people, and obviously I don't want to give anything away, there are some people who are upset with how it ended. How do you feel when they reach out, and how do they get that message to you? Uh, a whole bunch of different ways. I've been on book tour, so sometimes they come up to me and be like, how dare you? <laughs> Other times they give me long reports about how they burst into tears. Yeah. Um, it's always usually love, though, even if it comes out sort of aggressive. So whoever, <laughs> I'm really grateful. Thank you, no matter what. Yes. And it does seem like maybe somebody has a, a head of steam to go up and say, how dare you? But I feel like you're <laughs> such a nice uh, person uh, uh, when you actually see you in the flesh. They probably don't want to actually yell that at you when the time comes. Yeah, but sometimes they do. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they work through that. And Sometimes they they're like, you know what? We have a problem. <laughs> well, it's a really special book, and it's so nice to have you back here. Thanks so much for making the time for us. Thank you, man. Hopefully this is. <laughs> hopefully you get free stuff. Send this man free stuff. Donna Kwame, Ajay Brandy, everybody. Team Gang All-Stars available now. Everybody buy your books. Please support local news by books. We're back